My name is Mark Laidlaw, and I'm the writer on Half-Life and Half-Life 2. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about the background of the story, the story for Half-Life 2 and how we came up with things in the story. Half-Life 2 continues the story of Half-Life 1, but you don't really need to have played Half-Life 1 to understand it. I, even if you played Half-Life 1, you're going to have a lot of questions when you start Half-Life 2. Um, Gordon Freeman is the protagonist, the viewpoint character of the story, and he really starts on the run without a lot of clues about what he's doing and why he's there. Uh, this is one of the things that we enjoyed playing with in the Half-Life franchise is letting the player figure out for themselves who they are, what they're doing, why they're there, why all these terrible things are happening to them. Well, when we set out to build Half-Life 2, we were in some ways creating the world all over again. Um, Half-Life 1 was so self-contained that you didn't really get a sense of anything outside the confines of the Black Mesa Research Facility where almost all of that first game took place. So um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the world that was suggested by Half-Life 1 and thinking of ways that that could open into a, a really limitless uh, set of possibilities for future games. We, we wanted something that we ourselves could explore this universe for a long time. Uh, mod authors could come in and pick a corner of it and just develop it, that there were a lot of different threads you could follow, little parallel stories. Uh, Half-Life 1, we had, there was uh, a lot of other adventures were told through the points of view of other characters in Black Mesa at the same time as Gordon Freeman. Um, and we, that, was a, that was a great thing for people to develop the first game because they understood Black Mesa. We wanted a world that would encompass a lot of different kinds of threats and uh, historical events and different kinds of aliens so that other people, when they want to come in and play around in this world, will have a, a really sort of lush, fertile playground to, to mess around in. I think we really expected a lot of people to um, compete with us in that space after Half-Life. Like A lot of people would really take that stuff and try to do it, but we found, again, we had picked such a really specific set of problems to solve that they really don't apply to most kinds of games. Uh, the Half-Life kind of game is this very specific particular thing. I mean, not many people want to tackle the issue of how do I have a main character who never speaks? We have to write every scene so that we're either not drawing attention to that or we're using that somehow. Um, so that's a great challenge for us and it, it keeps us really focused but um, I, d I don't think a lot of other games, it, it's irrelevant to what a lot of other people want to accomplish. So raising the bar, uh, in some ways it, it, it kind of affects the competitions, but in most ways it really affects just us. Uh, and, and we're really aware of that. How do we just keep progressing at a really steady pace and, and outdo ourselves? In the opening of the game, we let the player explore the city and get to know their surroundings and learn about the world. And, uh, we let the player really set their own pace for a while. Well, uh, now this was a really interesting design challenge because what we had was something that on paper sounded like a bunch of empty levels that sounded really boring. We knew that what we wanted to do there was build, create a sense of atmosphere and again immerse you in this world that you've never seen before. Learn about the rules of the world, learn what kind of uh, characters inhabit it. Um, but at the same time this is the opposite of the it's not so much the case now, but when we made Half-Life, the idea of starting a game without a weapon in your hand was just alien to everything else that was being done at the time. Um, I, I think people expected that of Half-Life 2, just in parallel to the first game. So we knew we were going to let you explore for a little while, but we really didn't know entirely how to, to build that space. So what we did was we concentrated on atmosphere. We cr tried to create through art and through uh, broadcast announcements and through the dialogue of the citizens around you, this sense of oppression and you're in a familiar environment but it's been altered in some ways you don't really understand yet. There's always more stuff than you can use. Um, we, I think in half, with Half-Life we cut easily a dozen monsters before we shipped and it was a similar thing here. We probably had two or three dozen things that, monsters and things like that that we loved but, but cut somewhere along the line. And these things, they never really go away. Um, 
sometimes the fans pull them out. They find out about them. They're in the SDK, and people bring them to life. Uh, a lot of times we will revisit things. There are things in Half-Life 2 that we wanted to do in Half-Life 1, but we just couldn't find a place for them. Um, some of those were scenes, some were ideas for gameplay, but I think a lot of the things that we didn't get to this time, um, if there's value in them, they're still there. We'll, we'll still pursue those. So I think that's one of the things coming out of the end of Half-Life 2, we're looking forward to, <clears throat> you know, how do we get to explore this material further. So I, I think the things that are gone for good, they people probably are better off that they're gone for good, but a lot of stuff that we have that we're looking forward to playing around with some more. This is to all the Xbox Half-Life 2 fans out there. Uh, I'm really excited that you're going to be able to get a chance to play this game on Xbox, and uh, hope you love the game. Thanks a lot for your time. Was that you knocking? I didn't even know we still had a door.